Good morning, everybody, and I'd like to welcome everybody to uh, JTMS panel one, uh, Issues in Ocean Governance. So uh, I'd like to say first, excuse me, as my face turns from side to side as a hybrid event, um, I'm speaking online to you and offline to others. Um, so uh, welcome everybody uh, online and, and here in the room. Thank you for attending. Um, sorry, we have started just a couple minutes late, but uh, I will try and make up time in my own presentation later. Uh, we have four speakers uh, this morning and uh, each are going to have uh, 16 minutes to present. And I will give you a warning with about two minutes to go. After the four presenters have, have done their bit, then uh, we will be joined by discussants and uh, we will have a Q&A uh, for our speakers. So uh, with no further ado, let's go ahead and get started with our panel. Our first speaker is Dr. Abdullah Al-Alif from Yokohama City University in Japan. And he is gonna present on COVID-19 and the challenges of global ocean governance. Good morning to everyone. Um, and um, maybe a good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here in the beautiful city of Seoul this morning, and also delighted to be part of this panel, JTMS1. Uh, I will be presenting on the post-COVID challenges of ocean governance. And within a lot of challenges, we have a little bit of opportunities as well. And um, I will have uh, a couple of uh, points to be made in the beginning. Uh, with some usual disclaimers. So first of all, uh, the presentation slides will have beautiful pictures on the left-hand side, and these photos are taken from dreamstime.com. And so let me begin with uh, the outline of the presentation. So we all know that COVID-19 was a big challenge to humanity in the last two years. So starting in, uh, in January 2020, we are having hard times facing a lot of challenges in different parts um, of the world and different uh, issues in our lives. But ocean governance was not immune from this COVID-19 challenges as well. So there were issues that arose uh, due to COVID-19 um, that impacted ocean and its uses. So my presentation will be divided in two parts. The first part, I'll be talking about what are the challenges uh, that has been posed uh, due to COVID-19 in uh, ocean governance uh, regimes, et cetera. And then I'll also be talking about how we could best address these issues. But uh, one disclaimer would be the presentation will not talk about ocean governance. And when we human consume those fish, we take microplastics as well. Now, how do we address this? So there has been a there has been a global momentum for the adoption of a plastic pollution treaty. So a treaty that would address plastic pollution. Now, if we could um, adopt the plastic pollution treaty sometime soon, I think that would go a long way. In addressing this problem that has occurred due to COVID 19. But there, there are other things that we could do. The first one is not to discriminate, uh, rather to be united in taking actions against plastic pollution. Because if we only focus on Asia and blame Asia for producing the most amount of medical waste, that's not going to solve our problem. So we need close cooperation in addressing these issues. And uh, there need to be um, sort of cooperation regime from the developed world to the developing world in addressing waste in general and medical waste uh, for which we use medical waste in particular is because um, although the the most amount of waste generated in the developed world and their risk management system is not as, as advanced as the developed countries but still eventually it will have to be so the cooperation regime should be there to address the issue to have everything. The second challenge that I'm going to talk about is the deferral and uh, uh, say suspension of, of management meetings. So as I was saying that uh, regional ocean management organizations and other marine management organizations that have member states and have delegates coming I mean, from member states sitting together to take conservation measures uh, to address the 
conservation risks to the parent living resources. Now, due to COVID induced restrictions and lockdowns, these meetings are either deferred or postponed, or sometimes that they have been cancelled. So, this deferral or cancellation of management meeting puts the uh, living resources at risk. And, uh, and sometimes the Zoom meetings are not as effective as in person meetings. And uh, there were um, events where these conservation meetings were only able to roll over the conservation measures that were there instead of having more stricter and maybe better and bigger management meetings. So, one example was in 2021. Um, Inter American Tropical Tuna Commission members, they, they failed to come to a conclusion uh, regarding a rollover of the existing conservation measures. So, uh, in, in the first attempt, but in the second attempt, they uh, they, they put to this. So, in the meanwhile, between these two sessions, the conservation of the resources that they take care of was at rest. Now, how could we address this challenge, this deferral and uh, organizing virtual sessions for the conservation management members? Um, and so, my position is we could have, we could reimagine the whole thing. Um, it gives uh, the management meetings, the management meetings that are going to take, take place um, in person, it can be organized in a hybrid manner. For example, some activities could be uh, still online, but asynchronous. And we also have synchronous online activities side by side with in person meetings. It's because in person meetings are expensive in some countries and delegations from some uh, developing countries, uh, it's very hard for them to, to, to come and attend meetings um, flying along this time. So I think it's a reality that we have online sessions, but uh, if we could improve these sessions, uh, uh, to make the management decisions more comfortably for everyone to join and participate effectively, that would be the solution. And uh, in, in, in this regard, in this nation, one resolution uh, taken by the IOCC, the International Commission in 2022, they mentioned that their members, they offered this resolution saying that uh, the IOCC meetings would be uh, organizing meetings virtually because, uh, you know, it's, it's not only the, the cost that is involved, it rather virtual meetings also involve a lot of carbon emission because of you know, using transportation. And the third challenge that I mentioned is uh, the port access, free chains, access to healthcare, labor, and human rights on board um, passenger ships during COVID 19. So, so this challenge is quite well known because we read stories on newspapers saying that some ships are stuck and then they are not being able to disembark because port access was not granted by the closest port countries and so on. And um, this created a lot of hue and cry in the international community. And then the legal states came to the scene and, and um, scholars started citing international health regulations that are offered by the WHO they, they, that say that you cannot, one country cannot just stop um, and deny port access to a ship with infected passengers to trip. But that didn't solve the problem because countries were still hesitant to put their own people at risk by giving access to a ship that would infect passengers to move and trip. So in, in some cases, uh, we heard stories where the passengers in the were discriminated against because in cruise ships, passengers are from developed, developed countries, very rich countries with good uh, sports cars, but free from the developing countries. So there were some, some countries they allowed the ship and they allowed uh, passengers to move embark, but free were not allowed to move embark. So that is that was one problem. The other problem was ensuring human and labor rights of free, because we know that in maritime uh, labor convention, it talks about free change and providing them with uh, decent labor condition and human rights on board. But due to COVID-19, many uh, ship owners and uh, respective companies, they, um, they, they were not able to provide what uh, the free which is out, so, and, um, and, and the few support in many cases. So in addressing this issue, I think it's again the co cooperation that we can um, we can build and trust because if uh, countries they do not trust and they do not allow other countries ship to to disembark to um, uh, 
allow, allow the passengers to feel within the bar and do not facilitate medical treatment, then uh, it, the people will suffer. Uh, uh, irrespective of the nationality and the uh, age and the uh, So that's why the global cooperation again is in the second year. Between the is uh, the sort of priority during a pandemic and according human rights and humanitarian principles, which is right to life, right to medical treatment, non discrimination. These are the principles that should prevail in every situation and whatever emergencies there are. And resume consolidation is a, is a potential solution to this problem because we know that laws come from different conventions and treaties, like uh, separation of unlawful activities at sea, that is swap convention, that international health regulation by the WHO, the main labor convention, labor convention, MLC. But these conventions are, uh, these provisions are scattered and not always inconsistently with others. So if we can consolidate the, the provisions, um, that uh, that would be relevant for um, uh, international health emergency situation or similar situation. I think that could make things much easier. So in conclusion, I would say enhanced global cooperation is the, is the way forward. And um, due to COVID-19, many countries, uh, they uh, started taking unilateralism instead of multilateralism, which is the departure from the, the global uh, trend of, of cooperation. So I think um, this enhanced cooperation could solve all the three challenges that I mentioned uh, here. Uh, so this is uh, the bibliography, the resources that I used in my presentation. And um, I would just take one more minute just to say that within these challenges, we had some positive uh, as well. And these are opportunities. Uh, first one is fisheries activities were less intensive during the pandemic and probably due to lockdowns and so on. And in this, uh, this provided an opportunity for some fisheries that were depleted and that had uh, uh, that was facing difficulties to reveal. And also, COVID induced lockdowns had less tourism, so the marine pollution was less um, in, in beaches and in hot spots. And so the so we had uh, seen uh, ocean better ocean health and cleaner marine environment, and many species they returned to the ocean areas that were previously occupied by tourists and fishes. Uh, so finally, COVID demonstrated that uh, peaceful coexistence of human and nature is essential for sustainable development. With this, uh, I thank you all, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, all right. So uh, thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Uh, we'll move uh, right forward to our second presentation. Uh, it is from Julia Cerne Lima Weston from Catholic University of Portugal. And she will be speaking on the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea at 40. What has it done and what can it do for human rights? As mentioned, I'm Julia and I'm, I'm a PhD candidate at the Catholic University of Portugal. And today I'm going to talk a bit about uh, what the ETHOS has done and what it can do for human rights. So, um, my presentation somewhat focuses on whether the uncles is merely state centric, then it goes on, on, on to argue that it's in a way not. Why? Because we do have the basis for enforcing human rights, which is like state jurisdiction. We have uh, the creation of the ITLAS, and with that, we have the introduction of the jurisprudence on considerations of humanity. And we do have a prompt release uh, proceedings, which have direct impacts on individuals. And as concluding remarks, I'll, I'll draw a bit on what the uncles has done and how what it can still do for human rights moving forward. So um, is the uncles state centric? Yes. All the applications in the uncles are very state centric. They are drafted in a way that they include all states or states parties or states in general. So we don't have obligations imposed towards individuals in the UNCLOS. However, does that mean that the, the convention is limited to states in terms of its impacts? No, because the obligations within the UNCLOS can have an individual focus or have effects on individuals. And a classic example of that is that of prompt release uh, proceedings, which I will cover later in this presentation. So uh, first of all, 
the basics. So the one of the, the oldest principles within the law of the sea is that of the freedom of the high seas, which means that ships of all states can sail the high seas. But in order to sail the high seas, ships must be flat. And even though uh, the legislation applicable to the registration of ships is that of national laws within Articles 91 and 92 of the UNCLOS, Article 94 establishes flag state duties which must be followed by flag states. And these duties are, are of uh, enforcing its jurisdiction over social and technical matters within the vessel and its crew. And in that sense, these are the obligations that we need in order to apply human rights on board vessels. And also that's the jurisdiction that we need to propose prompt release proceedings. So with this jurisdiction as a basis, we have the need to apply human rights as we do need to apply human rights to individuals regardless of where they're located, including in vessels. That's the understanding of Professor Papanikovalopoulou, but also one that I endorse. And so another innovation that was brought by the Anglos and that uh, what contributed to human rights was the invention of the Hitlos itself. So um, the Hitlos is a fairly young tribunal and it has plenty of innovative jurisprudence, especially in terms of, for instance, applying the precautionary approach to the area. Uh, and with the jurisprudence of the uh, Hitlos, we have uh, something called transliterations of humanity. And this was first supplied within the MV Saga case, which was the prompt release case between St. Vincent and the Grandines in Guinea. And within the MV Saga case, the Itlo said constellations of humanity must apply in the law of the sea as they do in other areas of international law. Uh, this was is seen by some commentators as somewhat of an openness of the Itlo's to deal with human rights cases or human rights aspects of law of the sea cases in the future. And Judge Trevis actually even regards considerations of humanity as a substitute for the word human rights within uh, Italy's jurisprudence, which is quite interesting. And considerations of humanity is uh, evoked in subsequent cases as well, such as the Junior Trader case, the San Padre Pio case, and it's not evoked uniformly. And uh, it might change in terms of terminology, because in some cases we have considerations of humanity, and in some cases we have humanitarian, humanitarian considerations, but they technically mean the same. In terms of prop release proceedings, um, it's important to, to um, highlight that when we're talking about the Anglos, part 15 was already quite revolutionary when it established a compulsory dispute settlement means. And one of the uh, innovations of the Anglos was also the uh, obligation of prompt police cases, which could be, cases could be triggered when vessels or crews were not released upon the posting of a reasonable bond and security. So this is a state-centric obligation as it focuses on both flag and coastal states, but this deals with private interests of vessel, vessel owners, cargo owners, and those are the crew and the master of the ship. So, uh, in the separate opinion of Judge Travis within the Grand Prince case, uh, Judge Travis says that this uh, proceeding establishes for limited purposes a form of diplomatic protection that when a flag state submits and espouses a private claim of persons linked to it by the nationality of the ship, it somewhat um, creates a link of similar to that of diplomatic protection, which is the oldest way of international law to include individuals in state-centric claims. Uh, not only did we have the creation of prompt release uh, case uh, of prompt release as an institute with the Anglos, we also have parameters in terms of the penalties that can be applied by coastal state for the for the violation of fishing reg regulations in the deaths that are those that neither bodily harm nor imprisonment are allowed as penalties against uh, crews of, of, of detained vessels. Yet uh, we do have a, quite a discretionary array of other penalties that coastal state processes might use, but it those cases have also developed on how wide that discretionary power is. And they have said that 
it, that is limited to observing international human rights standards of due process, and those could cannot harm if life states right to prompt release. That was said in the Tommy Mora case. Uh, and this is, is regarded by commentator James Harrison as a potential interest of the to police compliance with human rights standards within prompt release cases. So this is yet another intrusion of human rights within the state-centric realm of, uh, of the law of the sea. So the concluding remarks, um, even though we do have somewhat of a state-centric framework within both the law of the sea and the UNCLOS itself, uh, what the UNCLOS established with the flag state jurisdiction with the creation of the ETLOS and the, cre the creation of prompt release proceedings, we do have a wider possibility to apply human rights at sea than we did previously to its inception. And even though we do have the state centric focus, we do have reflections on individuals and their human rights. So the UNCLOS will still remain the basis for cases to be submitted to the ETLOS and sort of uh, cases can be brought to other human rights courts and cases have been brought on the basis of jurisdiction to the European Court of Human Rights, for instance. So uh, this is also a contribution of the uncles moving forward. And the uncles itself also created the ETLOS and the ETLOS can remain somewhat of a guardian, perhaps in the future, by basing itself uh, on the uncles and other agreements that are not incompatible to it as its jurisdiction so that's so uh, my views for the <laughs> for uncles moving forward are quite optimistic and I do hope they 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 become concrete wishes but I do believe that even though we do have an apparent uh, very state-centric focus to the uncles we do have a lot of important contributions towards enforcing uh, human rights at sea through it Thank you very much. Um, we, we now have uh, Rahana Dawani joining us uh, as a panelist. So um, she is our third speaker today. Um, Ms. Dawani is a researcher in ocean affairs and marine environment, and she is going to be presenting on changing power dynamics and strategic stances in the Indo-Pacific post-Ukraine. Uh, thank you, and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, so uh, I have recently completed my LLM in international writing laws. And uh, so it's uh, uh, this conference even more special for me because it's the uh, first time I'm uh, uh, presenting a paper on uh, uh, aspects of international law of sea. So my topic for the uh, my paper topic is the changing power dynamics in strategic stances post-Ukraine, a perspective for sustainable ocean governance. Uh, the outline of my uh, paper, I have uh, tried to um, uh, uh, figure, uh, try to uh, uh, keep it a minimal in the uh, uh, present uh, PPT, uh, which is Indo-Pacific in overview, roles and responses so far, assessing the impact and lesson learned uh, the way forward. And the uh, uh, so. Uh, we go to the first slide, which is Indo-Pacific in the Ukraine crisis. So uh, the uh, Indo-Pacific is uh, is a center of power politics, and uh, due to its uh, geo uh, geopolitical and geostrategic importance, it makes it a center of uh, power politics and a crucial theater of engagement. Uh, it encompasses the uh, G20, G7, Quad Association of Southeast Asian uh, members, which makes it a key player. It also uh, provides uh, accounts for 60% of GD uh, global GDP. So um, it is a crucial theater and hotspot for the uh, various nations for providing uh, market and opportunity. Uh, how the uh, Indian Indo-Pacific and Ukraine crisis connected together, uh, the main one of the main reasons behind us is the war impacted uh, the Indo-Pacific governments by resolving the global energy and food supply chain. So as it says that if the uh, stoves in the houses don't burn up, they tend to burn the nations. So there are uh, many uh, a rise in the uh, food and uh, fuels uh, prices, and uh, it can lead to the uh, vo violative uh, consequences, and uh, uh, it might uh, fail the turbulence in the uh, government uh, of the Indo-Pacific. There are major security concerns as well, uh, which is uh, 
the war has impacted uh, severely the uh, geopolitical uh, relations and the, the power play role of the nations. Uh, many islands are uh, in the Indo-Pacific arena are uh, concerned about their uh, security uh, per se. Um, and uh, um, uh, regarding the Russia-China uh, ties, uh, we would like to, uh, the China's response uh, to the current situation and uh, how it is uh, um, supporting the Russia through the diplomatic and economic means are uh, uh, proves that the uh, India, Indo-Pacific, and European uh, uh, are not uh, cannot be uh, compartmental, compartmentalized uh, per se. Uh, the there can be seen the division and alliances. The division and alliances we see there are uh, three uh, 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 three. Um, uh, give me a moment. Um, three camps of the nations. The one is a supportive camp where uh, we see the uh, major uh, nations uh, like uh, the Australia, uh, even the South Korea. Uh, there are the uh, nations who are uh, stand in solidarity with the Ukraine and uh, uh, they are imposing a uh, san uh, harsh sanction. And uh, uh, South Korea is one of the first Asian country to be a part of uh, NATO uh, military alliance, uh, uh, sustainable military alliances and also join its uh, uh, cyber defense group. Uh, then there are the group uh, which is uh, which have a uh, little uh, uh, neutral role like India, Japan, uh, Indonesia, Pakistan. Uh, they mainly uh, their role depends upon the, uh, the ties with the Russia and uh, they prefer their uh, uh, alliances over uh, so they differ from uh, condemning openly and uh, even a lot of the states doesn't participate in voting at the UN General Assembly. So uh, the roles we can see, they are influenced by the uh, the ties and the the what are the need of the hour according to the nations. Uh, so uh, that's how uh, the second uh, slide is a, the, about role in international agency. Uh, the, the current uh, time is a test of international institutions. Uh, apart from the relief measures and support we see uh, regarding uh, the, uh, you, the uh, humanitarian initiatives and uh, deliveries, uh, the role of international agency need to be more influential and uh, 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 more to uh, uh, more towards uh, the uh, power play. So, uh, if we consider we there is a um, uh, need of the hour, we can see there is a more transparency and accountability in the veto power. The policy is aimed at diffusing tension and fortifying the global values chains uh, should be included. Uh, also, the, you know, the global peacemaking security needs to discover the new principle for changing the era of geo geopolitics because uh, then, uh, uh, through the um, old principles which are not working uh, very well for the current scenario doesn't uh, uh, helping right now. Uh, regarding assessing the impact, uh, the impact of the Ukraine is beyond bullets and bombs, as I say. Uh, it's uh, humongous and uh, it has destroyed uh, the uh, human uh, humanitarian all the morals or, or I can say the uh, principles. The impact it's on maritime trade and safety. So um, it has most long lasting impacts and uh, maritime shipping industry had uh, reacted very swiftly. Uh, there was uh, more than 18 to uh, not only the uh, naval, uh, uh, the naval warfare, it also includes the uh, uh, commercial vessels which were targeted, many more uh, the seafarers were, are going towards the sea, and the rights of uh, human rights at sea are going towards the sea blindness. And uh, uh, the, it also erupted to global fuel and food uh, security crisis. So what can be done? So according uh, to the, if we studied uh, to deal with the global, uh, global food and fuel, uh, food security crisis, we need a market transparency. So there is a risk of uh, concentration of uh, uh, food in the one hand uh, of the uh, 
particular nations. So we need to tackle that. Uh, we need more transparency and uh, easy prohibition on import and export of the burden of taxes from agriculture supplies. We need resource management and relocation of funds for the more sustainable options. Uh, the blockade at ports uh, must end and there should be a free flow of marine trade. Then the global food and security crisis could be tackled easily. There need to be sustainable alternatives. Uh, we need to look up for the uh, other uh, fossil fuels in the uh, sustainable alternatives for energy uh, supplies because Russia and the Ukraine is one of the major supplies in wheat and energy. Uh, we need to promote variable and small scale farming as well. And uh, regards to the Indo-Pacific specifically, the coordination needs to expedite their supply chain resilience internally. Uh, uh, regards to the impact on maritime and territorial biodiversity, the nature is a silent victim of war. The potential of transboundary impact we all know as uh, very uh, divesting. It not only impacted the uh, the area where the war is going on, the Black Sea and the Sea of Abos, but it also has uh, chilling effects on uh, Antarctic and other part of the oceans. The growing concerns of climate change recently in COP27, it was uh, stated that uh, uh, the uh, it has most havoc uh, impact on the nature. So where the solution lies? So if we, if we look at uh, the war uh, is in, still in the ninth, I guess, ninth month, uh, and there is no end of uh, uh, any uh, uh, end of we can see in the war. So we need to adopt more protocols for the protection of marine habitat during the war. There are no protocols. We need to create more protected zones and uh, particular sensitive areas. Uh, there uh, also need a reception facility at the port for the quick response uh, if there is any environmental damage and emergency. Uh, and uh, also the uh, not only the nations, but uh, the current BBNJ conversation also give to have more due regards to the transboundary impact assessment. Uh, then we go, uh, uh, come to the last part that is lesson learned and way forward. So indeed the war is a harsh teacher. It reveals the significant weakenings in the global uh, uh, and sustainable ocean governance. Uh, uh, the significant impact on security and larger interests in several developing nations. It pushed the risk of concentration of production in few countries. However, the uh, uh, the harsh sanction may also uh, uh, somewhere the, disturbing the global supply chain. So uh, sanctions and uh, we uh, we need to stop. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, for the uh, more um, sustainable governance, we need to adopt uh, and stop obsessing over the uh, uh, self-reliant policies, and there need uh, uh, there need to have uh, a prominent example is the uh, that we need to stop obsessing ourselves. Or, uh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, why I say that they need to stop obsessing over self line policy because the exception uh, to these are the COVID-19 times where we felt that the nations are together. So we need to uh, deal with this if the, uh, if the nations lead towards the uh, self line policy and uh, pr more production of fossil fuels and started production of the uh, coal oils. Uh, there will be no uh, near where we will uh, uh, we can achieve the uh, zero emission policy by 2050. Uh, also, agriculture supplies, as I stated above, the uh, need to be more, uh, more uh, burden free from the taxes. Also, uh, for the strategic stances, I say the standing policy game is the key. Uh, the, uh, the nations need to have uh, uh, strategically respond to the ongoing uh, nation. Also, the narrative of the uh, ongoing war can be changed if there is a uh, rise in a sea power, as I mentioned in my paper. Uh, the sea power and collective effort can uh, divert the narration of the current ongoing war. And uh, it also highlights the prominent picture that uh, that we are, we uh, we all are in this together. Even the war is going on in a particular area. It impacted the whole, uh, the world and globe together. And uh, uh, there is a, uh, in order to avoid the high possibility of war in the future, uh, we need uh, the uh, collective uh, efforts and uh, togetherness, I guess. Uh, that's uh, all I wanted uh, to highlight. And thank you.
My name is uh, Sean Mel, and uh, I'm from Dongsa University here in Busan, South Korea. And I'm going to be speaking on uh, technological international capacity in the English school triad, uh, an analysis of global undersea cable communications infrastructure. Uh, so unlike the previous three presentations, which um, in, in one sense were very practical and dealing with uh, policy issues that are, are relevant uh, currently, uh, mine is a rather theoretical uh, presentation. And so it's sort of the outlier uh, in the group. Um, some notes on English school theory, uh, just in case some of you don't know much about it. Um, it in general, it's got a very rich literature, sometimes uh, difficult to access um, and understand. Uh, it's often criticized as being uh, descriptive and not predictive. So it's not as popular as some other theories in international relations. Um, English school scholars tend to take a rather long historical perspective towards what we're looking at. They deal with more normative and quant uh, qualitative uh, subjects. And uh, the school is somewhat fractured between the philosophical end of the school and the structural uh, theory part of the school. Um, so it deals very little actually with technology, which is really the subject of my talk today. Um, so critics of the school, they tend to uh, lump together a group of critiques. The assumptions are confused, theories are problematic, concepts poorly formulated. Um, yet, I'm here today to present you a piece on it because I believe that it uh, has a really rich framework for understanding multi stakeholder um, policy issues. Uh, and unbeknownst, I think, to many English school scholars that deal directly with technology. So, at about four o'clock this morning, I realized that these slides were out of order because I thought of a new way to talk today, which is no big deal. But what I would like you to do is just jump forward to the third slide, and then we'll come back to number two. So uh, I am presenting uh, here based on the structural theory of uh, the English school, which is most mm -hmm. championed by Gary Busan and those who are associated with him. And uh, back in 1993, Busan, Jones, and Little, uh, they drew up uh, what they saw as a three-level sort of uh, framework for the international system. And at the top level, they had the structural level of analysis. And in the middle, you can see an interaction level of analysis. And at the bottom is the unit level of analysis. And what we're looking at particularly here today is this middle level of analysis. Um, in there, uh, they labeled what they call technological interaction capacity and uh, social interaction capacity. And these two interaction capacities are basically the amount of communication, transportation, or organization within the international system. And what they said is it's an aggregate field and that all states have access to it. And although it does have some push-pull relevance on the structure of the system and on the units at the lower level, for the most part, they imply it is somewhat benign. And then there was really only one way to look at interaction capacity, whether it was high in the system or low in the system. And of course, sitting here today doing a Zoom webinar and all of this riding out over the uh, global undersea uh, cable infrastructure, we can say that today's modern system is a high capacity system. It has high interaction capacity. And one might say, okay, we're done, analysis over. But I think there's a lot more to talk about uh, when we look at interaction capacity. So I'll ask you to skip back a slide to thank you to the purpose. So um, the first thing is we are looking at a piece of technological infrastructure. There's the global undersea communications cable infrastructure, which is either referred to as Gucci or Uchi. And there are over 500 uh, cables undersea cables, transporting some 99% of international data traffic. And these are systems that are in use or they're planned to be coming into use soon. Now, submarine cables are pretty simple. Uh, you need two landing stations. You need a landing station on the coast in one country and a landing station on the coast in another country. You need to string the cable between them and plug them into the landing station. 
But running from that landing station, which is on the territory of one state, the sovereign state, the, the pipe for communications goes inland to what we call a point of presence. And at this point of presence, the communication signal is handed over from the international to the domestic side. And so we're focusing here on this international infrastructure, not the domestic side, which would rely at the lower level of our frame. So my question was for myself, as I started reading more on the English school, and, and I used to work uh, uh, in the southern cable industry, I asked myself, does the structural English school theory really offer any meaningful approach to sort of study such infrastructure uh, in the international system? And I said, yeah. Uh, it does. I started looking at it and I thought we can really do something here that ES scholarship really hasn't touched on before. And there are two basic ways to do some analysis uh, through the English. I'll ask you to go forward two slides. There you go. Uh, the first way is a very traditional approach in ES scholarship, and this is the English school trial. Now, when it was originally made, it was a little different than this. Uh, it was a little more convoluted with an interstate society and an international society and a world society. And very Bouzon decided to restructure it into this triad that we see here. Interstate societies, these are societies of the state system. So the members are states, and these are all intergovernmental organizations that states belong to. And then we have transnational society. So think of multinational corporations or other entities that have agency and act on behalf of a group within the international system. And then interhuman societies, individuals, or those that are pieced together through imagined communities. So think about nationalism, religion, but down at the individual level where they're not acting together in concert in some with some after entity on their behalf. Okay. So if we take this framework and this triangle, we can look at each domain and determine how they act upon the Gucci system. So next slide. So I have two basic questions. And these come from questions that uh, Buzan and other scholars have been asking over time. The first was which domain of this triad is going to dominate the other two? That is, which is driving process? when it comes to international submarine cables? And is it going to affect system structure? And the second question was, what are the opportunities and constraints made possible, in this case, by technical, technological interaction capacity that contribute to its shove and shape influences? So looking at the domains, we can see that each has particular responsibilities when it comes to each. Uh, the interstate society domain, it deals with pr protection of cables within the sovereign maritime spaces. It also licenses cable landings on their sovereign territory. And of course, it allows transmission of data signals. The transnational society, well, they're the ones who design, build, uh, and set the international cables that we all know and love, uh, where all of our data, data travels across the world. So they create capacity, they plan systems, and they build systems. Now the interhuman society, you can say it, it, see it has no specific responsibilities. That's because it doesn't have an actor in the international system on its behalf. However, we should keep in mind that it is the insatiable desire for more data that is driving the buildup of capacity for more undersea cables. And so we're going to look in a little bit at the trends uh, that I think are very important. So one way to use English school theory is to go ahead and break it down by domains. And in this case, we see the domains do fit fairly well into a framework that outlines various responsibilities for international undersea cables. The other way to analyze in the English school uh, is through domain, uh, is through primary institutions. The primary institutions are considered the embedded behaviors among actors in the global system. And there are certain embedded behaviors and norms that have been there for a very long time. So at our interstate society domain, we have things like sovereignty. And the derivative of that in the English school is international law. And when it comes to 
um, the primary institution, often the English school likes to link a secondary institution. These are intergovernmental organizations or non-governmental organizations that have uh, actor capabilities. In this case, looking at international law with Uchi, we have the, tr the Treaty for Protection of Cables. We also have UNCLOS. These are two very important uh, legal instruments that deal with undersea cables. Transnational societies, the primary institution of advocacy uh, is very important here. Uh, advocating on behalf of undersea cables beyond multinational corporations that want more of them to, to pump data. Uh, we also have the International Cable Protection Committee, a group of 185 states that look after the protection and security of the infrastructure. Cable ship reviews across the world, and we have hyperscalers. Now, hyperscalers are large data consuming corporations. So in this case, Alphabet, uh, which is Google, Meta, which is Facebook, uh, Netflix, uh, you name it, I'm sure Zoom will be there very soon. Uh, so there are only a few of these major hyperscalers, Microsoft and Amazon included. At the interhuman societies level, I've listed the, listed the primary institutions of collective identity and trade. Um, but this domain doesn't really have organized group agency, so there's no secondary institution. But I feel it's really important because, of course, the reason people go on Facebook and go on Instagram and, and they, these sites have billions of followers and are uploading petabits of data every day is because people are searching for some form of collective identity and they are part of an interhuman collective. As well in trade, over-the-top carriers, Netflix, YouTube, videos. Video is 80% of data traffic over these undersea cases. And so this element of, say, trade between human beings at a very individual level, thus consuming goods, is very important and why uh, the system works the way it does. So the current trends, uh, some of which are worrying to me, 43% uh, of the current cables that are in service are going to be out of service by 2031. Uh, what this means is we're going to need a whole lot of new cables. But the worry here is that by 2024, 80% of the new builds are going to be single owner cables. So when we look at the at undersea cables, you have single owner cable or multi owner cables. Multi owner cables are generally a consortium that often have 10 or more entities that have a controlling interest. And so they make decisions on what happens with that cable and how the system operates together. However, a single owner cable may have one owner or maybe it's two in partnership, maybe three at the outside. So they control the, the cable itself and therefore they can choose what data to route over the cable. And so we've already seen that Google itself, um, or I should say Meta, uh, Alphabet, sorry, the straight Google as Alphabet has laid a cable from the west coast of the United States down to the west coast of South America. They own the cable, it's their cable, it's linked from one data center to another data center, and they can control the traffic. So these will be 80% of the new builds. By 2024, hyperscales, who are major data companies, they're driving 23% of new builds, and this is expected to keep increasing. And the bandwidth demand is projected to double every two years for this foreseeable future. So, so, as I looked at this, I had to ask myself on the analysis two different questions. One, which domain dominates? Well, in this case, they're all codependent. You can't have submarine cable infrastructure without states providing licensing and providing protection. You certainly can't have it without transnational society building, planning, and laying structures. And you can't have the demand for these systems without human beings wanting more and more data. The question is, as new builds come about and as single owner cables increase, and we expect that single ownership cables will be more than 80% and perhaps 90%, of all new builds and cables by say 2045 to 2050. So as we move out more neutral carriers with many owners and have single owner carriers, 
Is there a possibility that structural change could come to the system? My worry is that yes, it may. The fact is that if single owner cables are predominant and the owners control the data routing over that cable and into their own data centers or across the globe, but they can balkanize the internet, what we can have are regions of like minded entities or regions of like minded states supporting entities that allow data to travel in certain circles without going in to other territories. And you could certainly see this happening perhaps among uh, states, maybe China, Russia, authoritarian states that want to keep away from the US financial system or away from the global financial system, or the US and like minded states trying to keep China or other states out of the system for security reasons. So transnational society here becomes very important. And I wonder if they're not gonna have a much greater effect on the security and the manipulation of data as they start to gain an ever larger control of undersea communications cable infrastructure. And so in English school theory, I think they're underappreciated, especially technological interaction capacity. And I believe they should look at it more, that we all should consider it more, uh, because it has become the ever more uh, important aspect uh, in data domination for our lives. That is all. Thank you very much. All right, so um, it is time now for uh, the Q&A session of the Fortune Camp. We do have two discussants with us. They were online uh, with our uh, Zoom connection. So our two discussants for this panel, uh, Julia Cerne and Raymond Weston, presented today great and uh we are also joined by mario magalache i'm gonna go with that i'm not quite sure i think i just put your name very sorry uh but we will open it up for uh our discussions uh to ask some questions and then uh we'll take them from the audience as well if we have a second so uh whoever would like to sort of raise a hand and send us a question that would be great um, hello to everybody. It's very nice to participate uh, in this conference and very best to all the present presenters of the papers. And it was an incredible session, I would say. And one of the um, questions that um, I have, it's uh, related to um, COVID-19 and global governance issue. And um, since COVID-19 has like significantly changed the whole maritime um, the system, um, it has different um, effects on it and positive and negative at the same um, time. And it's opened the possibility to uh, develop the uh, relevant and uh, various international legal instruments and um, reveal the gaps that uh, has been existed. One of the important papers uh, presented in this session was um, uh, COVID-19 and effects on um, environmental issues. And uh, here I have one question um, about the concept um, that has been uh, wrote and stated by the presenter. It, it, it is a plastic pandemic. And I would love to know uh, from the author of the uh, article more about this concept and um, it is also very important to, and from my perspective and maybe for other perspectives as well, um, during the COVID-19, the uh, managemental issues, the operational issues, the procedural issues has been um, like implemented and enforced through the online sessions. And um, the question is how effectively those online discussions and decision-making process um, like uh, influenced and have ev effectively the um, on the international and regional or national level the uh, matters of environmental maritime environmental protection was leaded and organized. So um, this is the questions to the first. Um, 
presenter. And the second presenter was also incredible uh, talking about um, human rights issues and uh, standards um, and applicable law jurisdiction and state um, capabilities and um, mandates in respect to um, in respect to prompt release cases and you also gorgeously underlined the international um, law of this the law of the sea treaty tribunals con, um, contribution in this respect and there are various decisions in respect of prompt release but my question is that um, soft law under the, from the soft law perspective the decision that has been developed um, in order to effectively protect human rights issues in the sea. Um, how far UNCLOS goes? Because we at, the, at, at, at this moment, there are various discussion in this respect that UNCLOS is not properly, relevantly, efficiently covers the human rights matters. And uh, in this respect, maybe uh, the enlargement um, of the Article 94 is one of the um, one of the possibilities for lawyers to do. We like to enlarge the articles and put the matters that we want them uh, th th that we want. Uh, to be there, but um, at the moment, do, having taken into account the importance, the problematic of the protection of human rights, how far and how effective UNCLOS itself it, it is. So, because we read UNCLOS in line with other legal instruments, and that would be um, very interesting uh, to know from um, to know from Miss Julia from your perspective. And I have another. Good question to uh, Mrs. Re uh, Rihanna, if I uh, pronounce it correctly. First of all, thank you for your information in this respect. In from the Black Sea perspective, I'm um, I'm uh, from Georgia and. Um, the consequences of the Russian-Ukraine war uh, directly had an effect on uh, Georgia as well. But you you were talking about like very very um, important matters, and you saw uh, certain matters from geopolitical perspective, and you analyzed Russia-China's ties, and you also talked about the solutions, um, how to deal with the consequences effectively. So. So, but my question to you would be how you see um, the war is not ended at the moment. There is not any um, any uh, clear result at the at, at this level. It, it is one of the largest. Uh, and longest war that we had uh, um, in the in the Black Sea region. So um, and it definitely has the consequences on environmental protection. It's um, like no, without no doubt. But how you see uh, what could be done in order to somehow um, like affect positively and suspend these negative consequences, not only on the food security matters, on, um, you also said, sustainable alternatives, and you also talk about energy matters, how you see these uh, issues um, developed and ongoing, having due regard to the fact that Russia is not giving up and the war is going. Um, thank you for giving opportunities and all the best luck for the presenters. I do really enjoyed your papers. Um, and thank you again for giving opportunities. Um, that's, that's it. Why don't you go ahead and take the first response there since the question was brief. Fantastic. Thank you very much for your interesting question. Actually, um, I didn't focus on the point that you, the issue that you raised. That was on my slide. Uh, so let me now explain the term plastic pollution. It's very interesting. One author, uh, a couple of authors, uh, Prasher and Pike, in, in the 2021 paper, they uh, termed this plastic pollution when referring to the abundance of plastics that are surrounded by our community, our environment, during 
COVID-19. So it was there before and it is it is there now. But during COVID-19, there was an influx of plastic materials. They came in all different sizes and shapes. For example, we had medical equipment like shrines and wheels and, and wrapping of medicines and etc. Then we have personal protective equipment like PPE, the mask that we wear. Um, although I wear a cloth mask and this is reusable, but some people use the um, uh, you know, the disposable ones, and they end up being in, into the ocean. And then we have the takeaway food. And when you go to a restaurant and order food and have it, you do not use plastic that much. But when you order, there are a lot of packaging that comes in. So all this three creating a plastic pandemic during the COVID-19. So this is what uh, these two authors, they claimed in their paper, uh, 2021 paper. Uh, coming back to the second question, which is effectiveness of the virtual meetings conducted by the delegates of regional fisheries management organizations or other uh, conservation bodies. This is again a very good question, and, and many authors actually raise concerns about the effectiveness of these meetings. It's because when we sit around in person, we have the time and energy to interact and to exchange views and come up with uh, uh, with, with a solution that better suits the situation. But when we meet virtually, the effectiveness becomes a question, and then there are a question of transparency, there are a question of accountability and access. For example, the strength and uh, reliability of internet connection in some parts of the world are not that great. So many to many delegates may not hear properly, may not speak, uh, properly or other other delegates may not hear them properly. So there are a couple of issues that come in and that uh, raises questions about the effectiveness of these uh, management meetings. And more so when the system is based on consensus. So it's not like you have, you organize a vote and some people vote in for and some people in against and you take up the, the majority decision. It, it's not like that. Most bodies that work in consensus-based system, which means everyone needs to agree on the matter. And when it comes to organizing this station consensus-based system in, in online forum, it becomes problematic because in, in some way, uh, some delegates feel left behind, some feel pressurized to vote on a particular um, you know, uh, side. So these issues come in and that's why many scholars and commentators, they raise concerns about the effectiveness of this meeting. And I propose in my uh, conclusion that we can still use some aspects of the management meeting virtually with asynchronous and synchronous activities. Like you post a video to explain the thing and everybody after watching the video, they put their comments and they discuss this. So we have we could have elements of both online and offline thing and synchronous and asynchronous activities to create the session more interactive. I hope I answered your question. Uh, may I may I uh, put one more question because it's a very nice aspect. So when it comes to environmental protection and in um, and to this issue, we we all know that uh, matters of capacity building and uh, matters of um, knowledge sharing and transfer technology and other like uh, in other issues and other players such as international organizations, um, RMFOs and and, uh, state organizations, other state uh, stakeholders interested in this matter. Um, like, let put your concept in the global perspective. Um, like, even the process is synchronized, and even the even we can use online. Is this? Um, I'm rather staying very skeptical to this matter because when it comes to the, those kind of important matters. Um, what 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 is your opinion? How effectively online and Zoom meetings can deal with the such as important matters, taking into account that you have to deal with the as you said multilateralism, precautionary or other principles, so on. Put the, those issues together and um, imagine that everything is going online. At the end of the day, the results that we want to uh, have on the table. 
are we are we there is this enough uh, mechanism or should be um should be other um methods also used um this is my clarification position in, in your paper but thank you so much okay i think i would agree to the the concern that you raised yes uh, these online technologies like zoom they have their um limitations like certain number of participants can join and not more than that so that is one the second one is the timing so here it's it's a morning in seoul but that's evening in some other parts of the world and that's late of the night in other parts so people cannot like interact in synchronous activity so that's why i propose a combination of both asynchronous and synchronous and i think we could increase and uh, increase the effectiveness of this communication further Thank you. So uh, thank you for the question, Miriam. That's a very, very important one. I'll be very brief. Um, so in my view, amending the uncles is not a possibility. I don't think it is. Like we, we're not in a similar moment that we were in 1982. Like this is not a possibility. I, I know we lawyers have this mania of thinking adding new stuff is good, adding new stuff is good. In this case, I think what we have is just, just enough as a basis, we can draw up on it through discussions. We can draw up on it through, through jurisprudence as the ethos is doing. So I think there are many ways of uh, conciliating what we have with what we need. So it's all a matter of applying it. Thank you. Well, responding to the question, uh, the first I, for the first part uh, regarding what can we do effectively do to, uh, to put an end to this barbaric war. So, as I mentioned, the uh, the rising sea power can change the narration. So, if the nations come together, it's not about the uh, the sea power; it's about the naval uh, warfare or the strong naval military forces, but also the like-minded states uh, having uh, the interest in uh, in the same concept regarding the freedom of seas in. Uh, uh, respecting each other's uh, 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 territorial integrity uh, can bring nation more together in if collective efforts can put the Russia to confront and uh, stop uh, these uh, war. Also, uh, the policy, uh, as I said, the strengthening the policy game. Uh, if nation, uh, uh, the coordination, as I said, supply to chain resilience internally can also uh, put pressure on the Russia as now the what tactics they are using is they are uh, selling for raising the demand they are selling the oil in much cheaper prices so uh, due to the harsh uh, sanctions and if the chain res uh, resilience internally with other nations collectively increase the Russia will uh, will take uh, will be powerless in in uh, the coming future uh, also respond to the, uh, the second part of question that is environmental damage you uh, mentioned. So I guess uh, the key behind it is the uh, when there are uh, so many concerns like uh, uh, illegal fishing and uh, plastic pollution, uh, then there are uh, many other uh, environmental impact of due to uh, the the war, ongoing war, and so I said that we need the protocols. And secondly, these uh, these uh, uh, threats, environmental threats, doesn't really make to the uh, to the uh, nation top uh, top priority list. When these uh, these issue, environmental damage issue, will make uh, to the nation's uh, policy top priority list, I guess the change will uh, we will see the change in uh, the uh, future in coming days.